Je vais maintenant avoir le plaisir d'accueillir Franco Ongaro, qui est donc directeur technique et management de la qualité à l'Agence spatiale européenne, qui va nous délivrer une keynote speech pour nous parler des enjeux de la recherche technologique dans les programmes spatiaux. Franco Ongaro. Bah, bonjour, euh, messieurs, dames, et bonjour. Euh, merci de m'avoir invité à ce moment très important. D'ailleurs, je dois dire que je vous félicite euh, sur la choix du nom, parce que je, je suis un ingénieur aéronautique, même euh, si livré à l'espace. Euh, Santé Exupéry était un de mes héros comme enfant. Et je dois dire qu'il constitue un lien idéal avec l'espace, justement pour le Petit Prince et sa visite des astéroïdes. Mais j'espère ne pas donner des mystères <rire> liés au passeport. Bon, euh, vous m'excuserez, mais je continuerai en anglais. Comme ça, on donne une petite dimension européenne à l'affaire. Ça, ça rend un peu moins comique mon speech avec mon accent italien. Donc, euh, So, uh, thank you very much for having me here. My speech will touch very quickly on a few points that uh, my friend Marc Piercher suggested uh, you may be interested in, in terms of our experience in space with respect to your uh, upcoming IRT. So, on the key challenges for uh, R&T for space applications, I will be relatively short, I will go more in detail on our lesson learned from uh, space programs in technology integration, in the value added of concurrent engineering and integrated teams, cooperation with industry and academia, synergies and valorization across uh, application fields and uh, new ways to develop technology in Europe. Don't worry, I will not aggravate your delay. <laughs> so I'll go very quickly on the challenges of space because that's, that's relatively Simple in a sense. We gotta go further. Uh, we gotta last longer. We need more data down to ground. We need more data for the applications. We need more resolution. Uh, all of this means uh, more performing onboard embedded systems, more performing overall power systems, new materials, Uh, and the capacity of developing and harnessing as many brains as you can to solve problems which are becoming more and more complex. Just to give you a few examples of what we are already doing today, which means what we need to do in the future, as we speak, uh, the Voyager 1 is leaving the solar system. It was launched in 77. So uh, <laughs> we get back a few bits per minute, and probably they're just accumulating now because the NASA is on furlough for the moment. But uh, uh, that gives you an image of the kind of length of time we need to think of for space systems. Uh, some of you may have seen the wonderful image of Planck of the cosmic background in uh, 380,000 years ago, the first light from the universe. It's a big map yellow and blue, few people realize that the difference between the yellow and blue zones are equivalent to one millionth of a Kelvin. And in order to measure that, we have a sensor in orbit that it's 0.1 Kelvin from absolute zero. Uh, which means probably we know where the coldest point of the universe is because we put it there. So uh, that's the kind of challenges we have. Uh, Let me just mention a couple more which are dear to my heart. Uh, we're not going to make uh, launcher fairings as big as the Super Guppy or the Beluga. And as a result, when we need longer baseline for our optics, we need to do that by separating satellites and keeping them as a rigid body. 150 meters with micrometer accuracy, that's what we're looking for for our Proba 3. Uh, system. Uh, last but not least, we're faced ourselves with the problems of pollution. And after working for 50 years in trying to make things re-enter without breaking up, 
Now we got to do exactly the opposite and figure out what materials are we going to use that can re-enter by burning in the atmosphere. Because we now got to get out there every after 25 years and we got a lot of stuff up there that we have to re-enter and re-enter safely. Now, uh, integrating technologies, what do we learn in integrated uh, collaboration? When does R&T for, uh, uh, how do you get the R&T in projects? I think this is always a very big challenge because when you do research and development for technology, you want to increase performance. You don't really look at what it's going to be the product afterwards. And it's in that transition between increasing the performance and actually getting to a product that you have a problem. Uh, we're trying to solve it now to getting more quality control in an earlier phase of development. It's a bit of a waste because not all developments become products. But on the other hand, uh, you don't want to have a product which is not able to be qualified because it's based on materials that you can't use. So that's a very tricky issue for us. And of course, how much risk are projects willing to take? Because when you rely on a product that you know, that takes away a liability from your entire project. And that's one of the difficulties in inserting new technologies in projects. Um, laboratories are key in this, and shared laboratories help work with other domains. So they're a key uh, help as well. Um, we make a lot of use of concurrent engineering. We have uh, almost 15 years of experience, it's well established. What happens next? I think what happens next is trying to do to transfer the open source model to development of technology and systems. Uh, and that's a very difficult thing to do because on the one hand, you harness an enormous amount of brains. On the other hand, how do you pay them? How do you guarantee IPR? So it's a very, very difficult game in trying to convert the work we do with industry into a sort of open source model. Uh, we have a beginning. The latest uh, studies we've done in our concurrent design facility, we webcasted so the companies could participate in uh, by sending questions, by seeing what we were doing, etc. And this, at a pre-phase A level, allowed us to have a much wider view of what we do and then hopefully get our subsequent studies to uh, mature more quickly and have more input of different ideas. Um, another challenge will be to join model-based system engineering, the physics modeling of your systems, into the concurrent design. And that allows to go toward that virtual spacecraft that allows you to insert the technology earlier, see what the effect is, see if it's worthwhile. Uh, beyond this, I think uh, one thought which is very important, and it's going to transform the way we do things, we're all carrying around a wonderful computer with an incredible sensing capacity, and it's all networked. Uh, we're just discovering now the things we, we can do with this. And once we start discovering them on ground, it's likely that we move them to space. And that's, to me, a very interesting next challenge. Coordination with academia for us is very important. I created a group called the Advanced Concept Team. It works very well. It's a multidisciplinary group. It's all PhDs. They're all from different domains. OK, I have some uh, uh, typical domains that I always keep there, fundamental physics. Uh, applied mathematics, uh, orbital mechanics, materials, but then we also had sometimes sociology, psychology, and art. Uh, you need to throw in some different ideas from time to time. Uh, we have a very flexible mechanism to work with university. That's the only group in ESA that basically works with the contractor. So about 20, 30 percent of any project value are done internally, but that's key to, you know, have this special relationship with the universities themselves. Um, and we have a very light contractual mechanism, we call it Ariadna. It's almost all electronics, and uh, usually we do for pre-IPR type work, which makes it a little bit easier. Um, their mandate, they can do anything which is interesting and logic, 
as long as it doesn't duplicate what we're doing as part of our mainstream work, because otherwise it should be somebody else that takes care of it. Um, one thing which has been key over the years, they bring in a lot of new ideas and new tools and ways to do things. We tend to hang on on things like email. They don't use email. Uh, we tend to hang on to uh, ways to use software that they don't do at all. Uh, they develop apps. Uh, they work in a different way from us, and they infuse that in our group. And I think uh, you, you have to realize this is a group of 15 guys and girls, mostly girls, and we have on the other side about 2,000 established engineers rather on my, I mean, I think we're unfortunately about 40 years of median age. So it's very good to have this group to wake us up from time to time. Um, let me accelerate here. Uh, a little touch on synergies and valorization across different fields. Um, clearly, there's a big difference between Apple, who sold 9, billion, 9 million new iPhones last weekend, and the kind of research we do in space for embedded systems. Uh, we have a little different scope. Uh, the key in finding synergies is really, first of all, to understand each other's language. Uh, and, and when I say language is culture, and what is really driving our research. And sometimes you find out surprising things. We were approached by a Formula One team, and uh, the things we found we do the same were not at all the things we thought. Uh, in fact, their long-term research is in, a, is in two classes from one Grand Prix to the next one, 15 days, and from one year to the next one, new set of rules, different car. Uh, for us, that is <laughs> out of this way. We work minimum three, four years in trying to develop a new technology. But their ability of turning around systems rapidly, uh, it's a fundamental asset for us. And their interest, like our interest in additive layering manufacturing for new materials, they can do that much quicker than we do. And that's, very, uh, that's an area where we can learn from each other very well. Um, aviation is another one. Uh, we, were, we are doing a program for uh, communication, for safety communications from uh, via satellite, from uh, uh, aircraft to ground. Uh, our telecommunication Mantra is usually push as many bits as you can through each hertz, and that's your objective. Clearly, for aviation, the objective is different. Don't lose any bit, and most of all, don't exchange them. So we're looking at protocols that are very different, and we have to learn how to deal with that. Uh, we look at protocols that have to be open from ICAO. That tells us that LTE is not a good protocol because it's written with IPR and cannot be generalized. So in all of this, we learn and we can transfer to other fields. So the fact of putting together researchers from these different fields is certainly an excellent way to shorten that. Um, I think we get to the end of it, and I'll try to make it as painless as possible. I think looking at the ways to develop technology in Europe uh, between agencies, labs, and industry, um, and when I say labs, I, I mean mostly academia, um, I think there's no fixed law, of course, or fixed border. But basically, when you look at agencies, agencies are there to take risk because they're covered by the public. They're there to take a long-term view. Uh, they're there to make no profit. And they're way, most of all, to share the knowledge for increasing the competitiveness of a sector. Uh, industry is there for profit. It usually has to work short term. Uh, it's allowing risk, but in a moderate way. And it's a big user of knowledge, of course. And academia, they can take high risk. Uh, they can have a very open view and long term. Uh, Usually, they don't, shouldn't make profit, or at least not at the loss of industry. Uh, but they're the knowledge generators. So as long as these roles are well understood in the partnership, I think uh, partnerships of this sort are very successful. And we've been working with other agencies and other uh, 
uh, and academia and of course all of the European industry uh, for many, many years. And I think uh, France and French aerospace industry is one of the pillars of European aerospace competence. So let me conclude by saying that the, uh, you should not forget uh, the social element. Uh, the best science and technology happen at the border of disciplines. So you have to keep multidisciplinarity, you have to keep uh, a, a range of inexperienced but enthusiastic and novel people mixed with experienced people that can steer them in the right direction or avoid pitfalls to be repeated. Um, last but not least, if I look around this room, I would judge the female presence to about 15 to 20 percent at best. As aerospace engineers, I would say we're missing out on the best half of the humanity's brain, so we should do something better about that. Thank you very much. <laughs>